Okay. All right. Welcome everyone to this LF Energy webinar, presenting an introduction to the trolley project. We have with us Christopher Atkins from MISO and Tori McKee from GE Vernova, who will be taking us through this introductory webinar. With that, I, uh, I will also mention that there is a Q&A feature in the Zoom interface. So if you have any questions, feel free to click on that and type your question at any time. We will wait until the end of the presentation, at which point we will go through the questions with the time remaining at that point. And with that, I will pass over to Tori, who is going to kick us off. All right, thanks, Dan. Uh, okay, so um, my name is Tori McKegg. I'm, I'm a principal architect with GE Vernova, uh, working on uh, the Charlie project in general um, for Gate 81. Um, strategy for us. Um, Christopher, do you want to just give a, the 10 seconds on yourself? Sure. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm Christopher Atkins. I'm a senior advisor at MISO. Um, and I have been focused on 81 and our implementation um, for about the last year with that. So I've been at MISO for seven years, uh, various positions before that, but really focused on 81 this, this year. All right. Excellent. So <clears throat> um, we're going to kind of, uh, of course, give you a high level what it is, where, uh, what, e what is Trolley. Um, we're going to talk a lot about why uh, Trolley is, is uh, uh, and, and what our goals are for the Trolley project and, and what the problem is we're trying to solve. Um, then I'll go through here that middle section, uh, showing some examples, right, kind of some practical usage. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if this is what a lot of you came here for, right, is just to kind of a, a walkthrough of uh, how do we use trolley in particular we're going to focus on um, forecast ARs and and how do you exchange them um, and then uh, we're going to kind of close out with uh, looking at uh, where the project is going um, and how we'd really love uh, your feedback and for you to get involved um, I apologize Christopher I don't remember is this uh, this one my section or are you jump into the next one um yeah if you want to continue that's great okay okay let's let's do that so a trolley and we'll break down the acronym the transmission ratings and operating limits information exchange uh is an open source project um and our mission is to define a, an open standard for communicating transmission ratings um and and you know kind of focused on aars but as as we discovered there's there's a lot of sort of subtle uh, uh, subtle consequences of what, what we're doing with Hurricane 81. Um, the goal here is to promote interoperability. Uh, and, and Christopher's going to dive into this in, in a lot more detail. Um, what we see is this, this very large problem. Um, there's a lot of different entities that need to exchange AAR data. Uh, and this uh, creates, a, it, it, the, the data exchanges can be quite complex. Um, the, uh, the the use cases for all the different kinds of things that need to be able to, to need to be able to interoperate are quite complex, um, and we aim to, uh, to to aid with that with this project. So there's a number of things that we're uh, that that we're building. Uh, the first one, which th there's uh, already quite a bit of work that that uh, that is is usable, is an open API specification. Um, this is really you know the spec itself and and, and uh, kind of your protocol definition. Uh, we want to define a conformance program to help basically facilitate interop testing, right? Um, we, we want something that, that uh, where you can get kind of some early verification that your integrations are working. 
Uh, and then also in open comments. So this is open source tools, things like uh, SDKs. What it isn't is a compliance standard. Uh, and, and I like Christopher calls this compliance with a capital C. I'm, I'm almost thinking it might have been funny if you were to put a capital C compliance in there. Um, we're, we're not here, you know, enforcing anything. Uh, Trolley as a project is really intended to be a tool to help you share data. There's no, you know, we can't force you to do anything. Um, it's a, it's very much an open source model, right? You, uh, you, you take it or leave it as it helps you. Um, there's also uh, a number of vendor offerings, including ours. Um, so uh, there's no server implementation here necessarily, right? Um, the, the intent is for this to be a protocol definition. So <clears throat> who is Trolley? Um, this is, uh, uh, and, and, and here this is kind of a, uh, a nice screenshot that, that we've got in here that, that sort of shows where all, all of the work in Trolley is, is done in the open. Uh, for those of you who ha have any familiarity with um, open source projects, um, you basically just need to create a GitHub account. It's free and you can kind of see what we're doing. Uh, so it's all fairly well documented on GitHub. So what it specifies here, and this, this diagram is, it shows a lot, um, but these are kind of the, the different kinds of interactions uh, that we see between somebody providing ratings and somebody who needs to capture them, um, which is, is really anybody implementing a trolley server. And there's a lot in here. Um, this doesn't mean that everybody has to do everything, uh, quite the contrary, but uh, trolley does potentially cover a lot of this stuff. So if we look at these things here, um, you know, the, the, the most uh, sort of the most prevalent ones or common ones for FERC 881 is going to be looking at, you know, rating snaps, uh, the, the, the ratings forecast. Um, but there's also, of course, what you can uh, trying to look at if you're working with a reliability coordinator, um, what are their actual in use ratings, which may be different from what you sent. Um, there's also things uh, that we have to cover such as exceptions, right? There's, there's a need for uh, temporary ratings of various sorts. Um, those may be covered in here. And then optionally seasonal ratings. Um, as part of uh, FERC 881, uh, a number of uh, grid operators are finding that the way they uh, the way they share seasonal ratings, the way they operate against seasonal ratings is is changing, and <clears throat> the uh, the seasonal ratings may be shared more frequently than they have in the past. Um, so we're able to cover that as well in Trolley. Um, within all these interactions, of course, we uh, we kind of wrap a little bit of of uh, best practice around that. So uh, there's a lot here uh, in, on the mechanics, which is what we mean by H HTTP conventions. Um, and then cybersecurity is an area where uh, we have kind of a, a, a limited ability to play in the trolley project because we're, we're interacting with people's existing infrastructure and um, we want to kind of value interoperability, but there are a number of places where uh, we can recommend some best practices and, and be somewhat opinionated. So with that, uh, Christopher, I uh, will uh, kick it over to you to uh, talk a little bit about interop and the reliability problem. Great, thank you. Can you um, stop sharing? It's not allowing me to share. Oh, it's, it doesn't let you take it? Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Can you guys see, can you see my screen, Tori? Uh, yeah. Great. <clears throat> okay. Um, so the story here really begins with, you know, uh, you know, the, the trolley project's focus is interoperability and, and the use cases that, that Tori um, sort of highlighted here are really around interop. Like there's a lot that a commercial product needs to do um, as a full solution to 881 in the context that of a say a reliability coordinator, an ISO or a transmission operator that that aren't part of the trolley specification. Um, and so we really want to talk about in this uh, webinar as an introduction to trolley, like what those use cases are and how they fit into um, 
the kind of post 881 implementation world. Um, so I, I availed myself of one of these, you know, new uh, AI image generators. It's um, it's it's sort of best not to name, uh, you know, the protect the innocent. <laughs> so um, these characters aren't meant to be glib. They're really just uh, meant to be stand-ins so that we're not calling out uh, folks in the, you know, like say the Eastern Interconnect um, and, you know, without their permission. So I wanted to um, to give you this slide just to kind of establish the characters and their names are meant to be sort of a mnemonic. Um, it's not a huge deal, but uh, we have an ISO and an RTO, Isabella and Rita, and then um, an external like non-FERC jurisdictional uh, reliability coordinator named Rich and um, Opal, the transmission operator, Remy, the, the REMC, the, um, and uh, Owen the, uh, is a transmission owner. Um, so this is a, a one line. Uh, those of you that are familiar with these will recognize this is missing a lot of important detail. It's, it's really not meant to be um, like, like, you know, a, a topology represented that a power systems engineer might use, but it does uh, give me a backdrop for a, an important vignette. And this is a, a, re, a very real, uh, like, topology, a real situation. The different colors are going to represent different ownerships of this overall facility. And um, I'm sort of throwing us all in at the deep end here. So the green is owned by um, Remy, and the REMC and, and Opal owns the orange bits. Um, uh, the Rich owns the blue bits and uh, Owen, the transmission owner, owns this, this pink bit, maroon in the, in the middle. Um, and then of course we've got Rita, the RTO and Isabel, the ISO. So <clears throat> one facility, and we've already got three, five, six entities involved. Um, and, and now like where historically, you know, they kind of call each other up and say, what's the seasonal rating when you transition? Um, and, and we'd sort of figure it out statically, more or less. Now we've got this hourly mandate. Um, so, and we're, we're, we're going across our sea boundaries too, right? We've got an, R, an RTO and an ISO. Um, and, and they've got uh, reliability services agreements with their respective um, stakeholders. So how do we coordinate all this? Well, let's, let's identify sort of the kind of obvious things. So Remy submits um, the most limiting ratings of their own uh, equipment on this facility to Rita, and uh, Rich does the same thing with Isabel. Um, and then Owen uh, is sort of a financial only entity in this, in this vignette. Um, so they're, they're not, you know, involved in day-to-day -day reliability operations. They delegate that to Opal. And Opal then um, has reliability uh, services uh, agreement with, <coughs> with Rita, and so submits to that. And then, of course, Isabel and Rita need to exchange, um, once, once you sort of determine this, um, like which is most limiting on their respective ends, so to speak, um, then you have to sort of find out what's the most uh, limiting global and, and of course they have uh, different emergency durations for their emergency ratings and um, they maybe change seasons at a different time. So, you know, we're just highlighting some of the, the complexities here. And I want to, well, this is when we, uh, so very early on my so realized that because we have situations like this, we have this need for uh, something like a clearing house. And, and the concept is that the RCs would, um, determine the most limiting regional rating from the local ratings that are given to them uh, for the, these various equipment owners. Um, then the same thing would happen at the other RC and then they would exchange. And what this animation really is meant to do is kind of highlight that this is an eventually consistent uh, problem and that there's a lot of exchange uh, around one set of ratings that, that needs to happen. Um, and that the you know, if we're all going to rely, uh, operate to the same limit, which we must, um, then there's a latency to that. Uh, that's just, you know, nature of distributed systems. So that's the clearinghouse concept. And uh, I want to, uh, to go on to say, like, you know, that isn't the common case, right? Everybody knows this is, there's a few, you know, I won't say a few, but like, 
it's hard to quantify exactly how many of these cases are, but even in the simplest case, um, things aren't exactly straightforward. So uh, in this, where Opal is submitting, Opal, the operator, Rita, the RTO, right? Is, are, they're submitting and they need to exchange these rigs and um, they have different responsibilities per, um, you know, their, their roles under FERC and NERC uh, uh, compliance guidelines and uh, as well as their, their tariffs um, and agreements. But, you know, sort of some, for, for our purposes, some basic uh, things to call out are the, you know, we've got, to, the Rita's got to use the uh, real-time forecast and seasonal ratings that, you know, you know, and if, in the case of Opal having, you know, being the sole owner of a facility, right, this is the simplest case that we're talking about where we don't have all that other coordination. Um, they've got to get those values and then use them in various uh, operations uh, processes, like, in four processes. Um, and then, you know, they potentially they have the role of determining limits based on stability analysis for that facility. Um, and, and different uh, RCs are gonna, are, you know, gonna implement that in different ways, but that's part of that, um, that responsibility. And then Opal, of course, has to, has the ratings methodology for the facility, their own equipment, and um, they need to determine at least hourly what the, the real time and forecast ratings are. And those of you that are familiar with 881 know that, um, you know, that forecast is 240 hours from, uh, and, and that it needs to be updated every hour, um, which is represents a, a pretty large amount of data and sort of is uh, not really appropriate for our, our um, uh, uh, heritage operations technology systems like ICP and SCADA. Um, just the, the volume, particularly at the RC level, is, is sort of, you know, intractable. Um, and, and that's where, uh, you know, this project comes in. We also have, um, you know, start just starting with that simple case of a single line and a single uh, operator that, that, you know, sort of has the sole responsibility. There's a lot of uh, open questions. And um, Tori, if you uh, want to jump, jump in on any of these feel free to just get off mute and no 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 i i, I think i think that's great and you know um to, to give people a picture of the problem i think you could do some some simple um you know back of the napkin math if you were to think about especially the problem of forecast ratings and doing it as skata points um what you'd have to do for each line you're exchanging um you know you could imagine okay what's what's the obvious data model for that you know you could have um, one SCADA point for each hour, so you've got 240. But wait, for some of these facilities, you need to get the in-use rating too. So we need SCADA points in and out, so we double that, so we've got 480. But wait, we've got to have normal emergency and, uh, like in, in MISO's case, normal emergency and, and load shed limits. So we end up with close to 1,500 SCADA points per line that we'd have to add. So not only is that... Uh, um, uh, really difficult on on the modelers um, that's going to push SCADA to the limits. And you also have to deal with the problem there that, that you know, what if this, what if an individual SCADA point is inconsistent, right? Like you can't really do a consistent forecast. Um, so I look here and, and interrupt challenges. Uh, and, and here I want to uh, kind of call out too, that this is the simplest possible use case, right? So here we're not even talking about necessarily the reading, the, the, uh, the clearing house problem. Um, so one of the things is is okay. We know that uh, uh, that the Rita here most likely because you know nobody's had to do this whole forecast rating thing before. So she's got a you know the the transmission owner has to build something. Um, real time rating publishing may also be needed or whatever's there expanded. Uh, <clears throat> there's some things here that get really subtle. One of the things that's that's commonly really tricky is the names of things. Right, the names of things on the network model and what is our shared understanding, uh, and especially interesting here if if the uh, the transmission owner or the reliability coordinator has different systems that use different names. Um, this is fairly common in things, especially if we start to to talk about let's say operational versus versus planning systems. Uh, there's of course security concerns. There's a lot of edge cases here on, you know, what do we do in the case of a communications blackout? What do we do in case of exceptions? Um, you know, what, uh, and, and of course, if uh, uh, we need to talk about, does 
the reliability coordinator ever um, need to override the ratings? And I understand actually with uh, with with some organizations, this has actually been a fairly controversial thing. Um, it, I think with the trolley project here, we don't really want to have an opinion, but we have to have a mechanism in place for for feedback. And that's you know whether you use it or not is something that uh, that you can talk that you can talk through with a, a between a, a transmission owner and reliability coordinator. Um, but even in these uh, uh, scenarios, you know what what happens when model changes occur and mapping of names, all that stuff is fairly tricky. Um, and this is still just the simplest use case. So, and I think if we go to the the the, the coming slides, we'll see like, yeah, this uh, <laughs> when we get the the more interesting, um, y you know, uh, uh, things like neighboring reliability coordinators. Uh, people who have joint own equipment, you know, we get all these other challenges. Um, and, and here you can kind of look at this, uh, you know, another nasty one is different jurisdictions use different, uh, different units for, uh, for your ratings. You know, um, there are, uh, uh, you know, MISO uses MVA. There's others that use a combination of megawatt and a power factor. Um, there are some out there I'm aware of that just use current. Uh, so how do we deal with this? Um, this one's subtle, and I don't know, Christopher. You can probably explain it to uh, better than me. I was thinking here about your, your one of your seams, right? Where, um, or no, I I, I was confused there. Not, not there's of course the different terminology. Um, I think I was thinking about the one on the bottom where there can be different timelines for you know if you're supposed to provide this this window once an hour. Well, which hours are we talking about, right? The, there there can be. Um, everybody's clocks are running a little bit different and there can be kind of this subtle time that, uh, that, that entities expect for, you know, forecasts for the next hour to come. Um, and yeah, then of course, a, yeah, that's a great one to highlight. I think yeah. sort of, you know, in the spirit of, of what the, the project is trying to do is be this um, open uh, conversation via community um, where we can drive consensus through like working software. Right. And, yeah. and, because there are um, reliability entities that can dictate terms, right? They have agreements that um, allow them to have the prerogative to, de to, to determine how things are going to be exchanged. Um, and all of us have been getting together for a couple of years now to really like work out like some of these questions. Um, and, and we don't necessarily have a like there's not like one answer that's going to work in every situation. Um, and that's as it should be. So what we need to do is create a standard that um, like, I like to think of it as like the, you know, let us, let's argue about the differences that make a difference um, and then accommodate everything else. Um, so that non sort of heavy lifting, that's non-differentiating, that's not really important to uh, reliability. We can, have a standard that allows you to 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 work the, you know coordinate reliability the way that uh, you intend to and but then preserves uh, a medium of exchange where we can resolve um, like how you work against how I work um, and that everyone is like always aware of of what the what we believe the values should be um, so that we can operate the the this like huge electromechanical machine reliably as we change its uh, available capacity hour to hour. And, you know, a lot of these questions aren't answered as a part of the trolley specification, right? But it, um, the universe of answers needs to be accommodated, uh, you know, in practice. So that's really what we're trying to achieve here by creating a, a language and a medium of exchange that's uh, fluent in um, the problem domain and why we're, you know, sort of highlighting the, these, what these challenges are. Right. Um, can, I, did, I, I, can, can I add one ahead. thing there too? Cause oh, I, I think that's, um, there's that bullet that's about two thirds the way down, you know, what if an entity, and, and so G Vernova has some, you know, accounts like this where, I mean, it's, it's kind of a nightmare scenario, right? Because reality is, um, you know, uh, I think Christopher's done a, a really good job of, of working with uh, the other uh, ISOs to, to, you know, establish different things they can do and shared visions. 
um, where, where they're possible. Uh, but the reality is, of course, every reliability coordinator footprint is done their FERC one strategy independently and, and they're all a little different. And, you know, what if you're a grid operator that has to, 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 to recognize, okay, well, for this part of my footprint, I need to do this thing, this, and, and then this other part, I need to do this thing. And your systems have to be kind of aware of this. Um, and it gets quite complex and, and, this is again, yeah. I, I agree with Christopher. Charlie doesn't solve it, but we wanted to have a, a vehicle that helps make some kind of sense about this and help you, you, you know, help you deal with some of the practical problems, right? Like if we look at this particular scenario, and then we go back to the the issue I mentioned about names. I mean, that's a disaster, right? Uh, or, or maybe I'm being dramatic, but the uh, in in that scenario, the if when the the uh, the TO has has multiple reliability coordinators. They need to be aware of the names of things, you know, in their internal systems, which may be different from each reliability coordinator's names. And they have to be aware of who they're exchanging with at any given time and, you know, syncing up models with those two reliability coordinators. So it's quite the challenge. And and what we've spent a lot of time thinking about is is how do you how do you provide people some tools to navigate this? Um, yeah. And the compounding the sort of uh, reliability coordination that you know op grid operation part of it and those the different terminology um, the different ways uh, they factor the problem you also have uh, a sea of vendors and this is in a very much a kind of a net new uh, not entirely net new but um, the kind of ubiquity uh, that's implied by the mandate from FERC like means that we're there are new systems and 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 augmented systems that need to come to market um and there are, you know just in our footprint we're aware of several vendors that uh, our uh, our stakeholders are are engaged with and um you know they they all need ratings right <laughs> all of these like uh, operations need ratings and it really I, you know it's the, the classic like you pull the thread and you get the whole sweater um so we want to make sure that, uh, you know, we believe that by defining an interoperability specification, we're uh, removing a lot, we're de-risking a lot of the system to system integrations, um, you know, by having a community that where you can, you know, go and ask a question like, what is this meant to be, right? And do it in a more collaborative open space than like the vendor silos that um, tend to uh, exist in, in the industry. Um, and it's, you know, it's just a, it's almost a, a bare necessity um, because, uh, you know, we have this now like very frequent interoperability uh, pulse, like every hour we're, we're changing all of the, the, the limits that we're using on, uh, in, on the grid. So uh, it sort of falls out that you need, you need to solve, make this uh, like landscape uh, manageable. Uh, for not from both the supply and the you know the vendor side and the consumer side the 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 grid operator side we 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 owe it to ourselves really to to try and standardize. Um, so uh, how can Trolley help with that? So we've talked obviously we hinted on that a little bit and and this is just a slide to really you know we we had uh, Owen and and Rita and everybody um, and, and we all like in the industry know who all these players are, but this is just kind of a roll call, right? Of, of those uh, who are invited and, 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 and really needed in the trolley community. And we'll talk a bit later about how you can get more engaged, but um, you know, clearly transmission providers and reliability coordinators, the ISOs, the RTOs, transmission owners, um, transmission operators, and all the vendors that uh, are touched by these uh, dynamic ratings um, and then, you know, there's a cast of, of people, everyone from uh, compliance experts, right, to um, IT uh, personnel, um, systems architects, power engineers, um, EMS experts, like those, all of those perspectives um, are going to add value to uh, this, this interoperability specification. And I want to... Um, Actually, let me, yeah, let me give uh, control to Tori. He's going to walk us through the rest of this section and uh, talk about like how you can 
Um, I, do I have that right, Tori? Let me make sure. Yeah, yeah, correct. yeah. Let's let's do the what here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it looks like you need to unshare, and then I can take it back. There you go. Okay. One second for me to awkwardly fumble around with Zoom. Okay. Good. All right. So yes, um, <clears throat> we kind of went through that. So uh, the specification is defined with a technology called Open API. Um, this is a, a a pretty standard, typical thing for for what are called REST services. Um, so. Uh, if you're not familiar with the technology, basically we're just doing everything over HTTP or really HTTPS. It's it's JSON formatted over that. Um, this exchange is divided into client and server roles, um, with the server typically being your reliability coordinator. Although it really doesn't have to be, right? It's it's a uh, um, anybody who want, needs to receive ratings and and clear them. Um, there's tools for really just about any. Um, if you name a programming language. There's probably a tool for it. For it. Um, although I was thinking, uh, uh, you know, I, I know our industry pretty well. I was thinking somebody would um, try to integrate this with Microsoft Excel. Um, I'm sure you can come up with a clean way to do it. I think I would write a program that scraped the Excel spreadsheet outside of Excel instead of a VBA script. But hey, you, you know, you can be creative. Um, <clears throat> the tools are all available online. So uh, what I'm going to do here is walk you through. Um, a number of these links uh, and and what's in here. So uh, there's there's a, the the main site has got uh, all kinds of just kind of documentation um, around concepts and and uh, and we've got some some usage examples. Um, the, there's a formal spec and the, the spec is visible in sort of two forms, right? One is um, and I'll go ahead and just demonstrate this. Uh, if we go to uh, yeah, yeah, you're fine. Um, the open API specification, this is a YAML file. Um, you can plug it into tools. This isn't really intended for human readability. Uh, if I go look at uh, this link here, it's basically the same thing, except generated as a website. So th this is the formal, you know, what are the different things that you can do here? So um, I see some questions we'll get through later, but like, if you wanted to look at, you know, how do you submit uh, forecasted ratings. Um, this uh, uh, this is what it looks like here, right? And it shows some some examples here in the the right hand pane, and there's formal descriptions of what all the parameters are. Um, the other thing, though, is is the website, which kind of links some of this together. So we have here uh, a number of of discussions of concepts and usage examples. Um, you know how uh, how the thing handles daylight savings is such a common question that uh, we ended up throwing it at the top. So uh, these are all kind of resources intended to, to, to help you here. Um, so I'm going to walk through some very concrete examples. Uh, and these kind of illustrate what we're uh, uh, the, the kind of the, the, the basic things, which is you, know, you want to be able to submit your forecast AARs to a server. So what does that look like? And then you, know, you may want to or you know, query the in-use ones if there's any chance that uh, you're um, your reliability coordinator, if you're a TO, could be operating against uh, different ratings than you are. So I'll walk through both of those. Uh, they can be found here. They're usage examples. We'll go to submitting forecast ratings. So um, this thing's broken up into a couple different sections. So there's, uh, there's, there's what are called headers here. And the header, this is a, a concept that, that uh, uh, we've added in the last couple weeks. Um, that's intended to provide hints. So the uh, the trolley server isn't really required to do anything with the header information. Um, but in, in most scenarios, uh, we'll see like certainly in, in, in MISOs, uh, the entire uh, body of the, the HTTP request will be logged, which is, is really helpful for again, uh, dealing with those, those various interop scenarios. So just to give you some examples of what's in here, why it's in here. So um, there's this idea here of, of a uh, uh, th defining what our various emergency ratings mean. So to use MISO as an example, uh, MISO has a, a continuous operating limit um, and then an emergency operating limit and a load shed operating limit the, defined in their, uh, their operations manuals. And there's sort of certain assumed meanings of wh what does an emergency rating mean? So here, 
we're defining what we think that means. Um, there are other scenarios where I know of that, you, you know, the uh, 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 various neighbors, neighboring entities can ha use the same uh, or use similar terminology that means the same thing, or they could use the same terminology like emergency, which is relatively generic, and it could technically mean a different thing in terms of the minutes. So this is kind of useful for knowing like, hey, when you said you're providing me emergency ratings, what did you mean by that? Uh, the other tricky thing here is how we deal with names. So uh, there's a lot of possibilities uh, as, as, as far as how this is handled. Um, we tried to make this uh, you know, more generic so that, that, uh, that the implementers of trolley servers have a lot of, of options. Our general philosophy is that there's a primary resource ID, um, whatever that's going to be. Um, whether it's uh, uh, in in the case of these these rating proposals here, um, a, a a line segment ID um, would be you know typically what we're talking about. Um, but then you know you could have kind of some alternate uh, names that we know of, and this is sort of um, backed by the the IEC SIM concept of of having separate name types. So here you're stating, you know, hey, what are the other names I might know this thing by? And this is very useful when you're, you're debugging a problem. Know, okay, what exactly were we talking about here? Um, so then we look into what you provide for the ratings. Uh, there's going to be, you know, the, the resource ID, whatever that is, uh, a list of periods. And here we explicitly define the start and end. You know, um, we went through a couple different iterations of this where we kind of talked at first about, you know, hourly things and, and so on and so forth. Um, the, the, the reason for this is, uh, so technically the first quarter says at least hourly. Um, we're also being uh, very explicit here about what period we're talking about and this format is daylight savings safe. Then we, we state here uh, the continuous operating limit. This is um, kind of a common thing. Every, uh, every grid operator we've, we've worked with has this, this concept of a normal rating. Um, and this is kind of what this is meant to represent, right? It's it's uh, it's somewhat special in the sense that it doesn't have a duration necessarily associated with it, right? It's assumed to be continuous. And then you have your set of uh, emergency operating limits, right? And what they are. So here we've got the one emergency rating that we've defined above, and you know we're saying we're providing a limit in MVA. Uh, good stuff. So, and then this, of course, this array continues for each additional period. Uh, so to send this thing, um, and here we provided some examples, um, and and here this this leaves off the the authentication because this could be very specific to your reliability coordinator, um, but it shows you know you could actually execute Charlie with just kind of command line utilities. So curl is a common thing. It's um, if if you've uh, uh, if you're running a Linux machine, you probably already have it, um, or or a Mac even most likely. Um, on Windows, it's a free uh, download tool, and you can just take a file here. So you, we've slapped all this JSON in input.json, and you run this curl command to send it to this trolley server, and there it is. We've uh, we've updated our ratings. So uh, one thing I also didn't mention here, actually, I'll come back to what a proposal is and why it's called this. Um, so this is how we submit ratings. Uh, likewise, you can do a similar thing to query back what's in use. So if I go here and, and look at um, this, here we start with a curl command and say, all right, I want to go grab um, all the ratings for my monitoring set, which I'll get to what monitoring sets are here shortly. Um, and this is grabbing specifically in use ratings, which is is a different, a distinctly different data set in Trolley than, than uh, uh, the the ratings that you you that, that a, a TO would provide to the uh, the trolley server. Uh, so here the the uh, the structure is very similar. So we've got um, a header concept here, which gives us a little bit of metadata. You know when was this thing updated? Um, who generated it? Which you know you think should be obvious because it's where things come from. But some of this is parody. You know what what the trolley server thinks these things mean. You know. Um, here, this is uh, uh, this is ice New England terminology, and um, and of course, what we think these power system objects are, right? So when I'm sending this back, here's what I know of. Here's here's what I think its other possible names are. Um, and then this kind of follows from uh, the same sort of of uh, of of things that 
the, the, the same set of uh, uh, kind of data, but but potentially defined on different identifiers. If we consider um, and you know jointly owned facilities, maybe divided up into segments, we could uh, roll up um, in the limit clearing process things from different segments into a single transmission facility. Um, <clears throat> you can also hear this just shows an example. You could this query as it was first written. Um, basically relies on the um, the clock on the trolley server for deciding you know when is the, the when does the next 240 hours start you know what does that mean um, you can be more explicit so here um, in the bottom we can actually say hey I want to get all ratings uh, starting from you know here I've, I've said uh, 2 a.m basically okay So I'll do a quick walkthrough. There's there's also the, this kind of concept. So I've mentioned these things a few times, uh, monitoring sets, proposals, snapshots. Um, I encourage people to browse this page. Um, and we kind of continue to add to it here. Um, we've got some some nice kind of UML diagrams that, that Christopher has added. Um, and, and I saw a few good questions in the chat. So I, I don't think, in, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go over a lot of these in detail. Um, I, I think it's probably a better use of time for us to for, for me to let you uh, read them and and I can kind of use the questions as a way to drive describing some of these things. Um, but again, I, I encourage you to, uh, to to use the these these resources available. Um, we realized uh, Christopher and I as as we were first uh, kind of preparing this, the the open API spec UI is useful, but doesn't it's not always obvious to people um, who are, are trying to learn about Trolley, what you do in here. And, and so the, um, the website was meant as a supplement that, that you can look at it in, in different ways um, as, to, uh, uh, as, as to, to how you're trying to understand what, what we're, we're doing. So uh, I'll move on from here. I'm cognizant of the time we've got left. I'll talk a little bit about Project Roadmap. Um, so uh, the, the goals here, I mean, we've kind of gone through this, uh, but the, uh, the, we're, we're kind of uh, starting here with the specification, um, but we want to move on to things like software development toolkits and compatibility toolkits. Uh, again, we're to, to facilitate, make interop easier is really our goal. Um, another big part of this is writing more documentation, right? And making sure that, that we're building up that shared language and that this uh, that Charlie becomes kind of a resource uh, for people to be able to support this exchange. Uh, the other thing that's pretty important for us is building a community of practitioners. So um, one of the things that we know is, uh, you know, we, certainly I work with quite a number of, of, of GE Vernovas customers, uh, Christopher at, at, at MISO, given MISO's position centrally in the country is is got a pretty broad perspective, but we know we're still missing stuff. and. We want people to help us kind of pull forward requirements um, before they're discovered, you know, when you're trying to integrate, right, where they become really expensive. So there's a few functional areas that we still need to cover. Um, directional ratings will come, I think, probably shortly here. Th there's a number of other minor refine refinements. We're mostly been focused on forecast ratings at the moment. Um, so, th but there are some things like real-time ratings, exceptions are already there in the spec, and I think th those need just need some refinement. Uh, seasonal ratings, I'm not happy with where we are in the model with that. Um, one of the big ones uh, is something we recall, I don't know, I think the peer, I think it's still a bit of a creepy name, but we need a, a way to talk about this. Um, uh, some more around how we deal with kind of neighboring RCs, excuse me, and, and tie line exchange. And then of course, some additional examples and, and security. Um, the conformance tests is up there and then client SDKs. Um, I'd love to see client SDKs of various languages. Uh, I think, you know, we'll, we'll see if we can logistically get to this, uh, us at, at G Vernova, it's, I, I'd like to contribute to Java one at some point because we do a lot of Java stuff internally, um, but I, I'd love to see other languages out there as well. So <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about how you can get involved because we really want 
more grid operators and vendors. Um, in that, that slide that Christopher showed early on, uh, where he showed that vendor landscape, um, one thing I'd add that G. Vernova's perspective on this, uh, you know, I'm asked by our, our commercial people all the time with different customers, you know, uh, so because we have, as a large vendor, we have customers all over that spectrum. And, you, you know, I'm, I'm asked, oh, okay, so so this customer needs this, how can we achieve it? And we need to talk to, to, to these people and so-and-so, and they have these neighbors that use this vendor. And what we've realized is we, if we want our customer base to be successful, we need to be able to talk to everybody and be, you know, as far as this is concerned, friends with everybody, including our, our competitors. So we really want you to be involved in this. Um, we want to help improve that shared language, discover requirements. What are we missing, you know, and fill those gaps um, and help us think through some of the hard things, right? So there's, what we're discovering is there's a lot of consequences of these data exchanges. You know, that's where things like the headers kind of came in. Things like the, the AAR exceptions and talking about, you know, what are the fallbacks and static ratings? Um, because, you know, Christopher mentioned how uh, kind of the, the the sunny day scenario is is a transmission owner computes some ratings, gives it to the reliability coordinator, and that's the end of the story, right? And that should cover what ninety five to ninety nine percent of everything that happens. But that other that other bit, that other five to one percent, is actually really hard, and we're spending a surprising amount of time on it. Um, there's also, you know. Where are there places where there's mismatches between the technical needs? Because, you know, we approach this, uh, um, Christopher and I both have very much backgrounds as software developers. Um, th there's, you know, if we talk about things like, uh, um, I know it's been brought up multiple times, the, the, the whole idea that the a transmission owner would query back um, the in-use ratings is controversial for some people. It doesn't match up with curtain, cur um certain kind of procedures and and, uh, and and agreements and expectations. Um, and, you know, those things need to be discussed. So uh, yeah, we wanna make sure, you know, hopefully the that this is a vehicle for that. So there's a bunch of ways you can do this. Um, <laughs> one is simply to use it, right? Um, just using Charlie, I think is, is helpful for us. Um, doesn't really require any ob obligation beyond open source license requirements. So, Assuming that that some of you are are, are relatively unpracticed with open source, um, we pick things that are well established uh, as license agreements that just offer production for for both us as as trolley uh, contributors and use as users as well. So um, some of these things, if we look at let's say the Apache software license, um, you know any of your legal people can can review these things and and just to to give you some idea. Uh, Anything that um, covers ASL 2.0 and within GE Vernova is um, auto approved for usage for, from a legal perspective, not a cybersecurity perspective. We do additional vetting. But my, my point there is that, that for, um, for a lot of software people, ASL is a very friendly license. And, and it's, it's the, the whole point of those licenses is to make it free and safe for you to use. Um, another one, and, and we'd love to get people on this right away. There's, there's really no obligation from you. Um, if you go to this link here, um, on GitHub, you'll see that there are um, issues, and 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 I'm thinking here, you know, there's um, th there's a, a bunch of questions. That, uh, uh, there's there's about ten we've got. I'm guessing we may not get to them all today. Um, come in here and write an issue, like please, you know, and and we want to see what what kinds of things we're missing. Um, you can create a GitHub account and it's free and it gives, there's no further obligation to us. You can come in here and create issues. You can comment on issues we've got in our, our roadmap. Um, that's a great way to, uh, to get involved with what we're doing. Um, as a contributor, right, um, this is where you actually submit stuff, which is something else we certainly need. Um, this is, you know, for submitting source and, and specifications. Um, we've got a, a contributor license agreement based on CSL 1.0. Um, that's not quite ready, but it'll be ready here, I think, uh, and I'm hoping in the next couple of weeks. Um, this idea of an editor, somebody who's not necessarily contributing to the spec or source code, but just improving our documentation. Um, if we have people that are only this role, I, I, I know Christopher and I have talked about some ideas for how we could 
set up a workflow where you don't have to sign the the specification license necessarily to just offer document improvements. Um, and then one of the things we really need are maintainers. So um, we have a technical steering committee, which right now is just Christopher and I, and we'd really like to expand that. Um, and this doesn't mean, you know, this doesn't mean you have to, to um, be a contributor as well, where you're actually doing technical work and approving source code and things. Um, although it can be, but what we really want are more, you know, people with kind of the business and domain expertise and make sure we're, we're taking Charlie in the right direction. So I think that gets us to the, uh, the end of the deck. Um, Christopher, sorry, yeah, I wanted to keep us going. Let's, let's, uh, let's do some questions. Yeah, let's do it. Um, yeah, and just apologies to everybody. If, if we don't get to your question, I'll uh, reiterate that um, you can create a new issue at the GitHub repo and tag it as a question. Um, and that will actually benefit uh, everyone that comes after this that maybe hasn't wasn't able to go to the webinar or listen yep. to it later. There will be a recording posted of this webinar later. Um, and so if we don't get to your question, um, look for an answer. Uh, <clears throat> we have a mailing list. Um, I, th I think the GitHub repo is a great place. And, you know, these questions are, are good fodder for, um, you know, new issues to improve the documentation, too. So I, uh, depending on on what we see here, we can dive into that. So, Tori, um, I'm going to start at the top. I'll ask the first mm -hmm. one and then you can try to answer it. So does the trolley okay. interface handle day night ratings? Right. Right. Um, I, I, I saw that one while you were talking, Christopher, and I think that's a an interesting discussion. And, and that's a great one for us to kind of follow up on. The reason I state that is most of the reliability, well, really all of the reliability coordinators that we've been doing, um, that, that I would say that, that Vernova has been doing kind of uh, serious work with so far on, on implementing a FERC one strategy, have kind of drawn a line in the sand and said, okay, um, well, okay, this isn't technically true with MISO, but but they've said, all right, we want transmission owners to provide us forecast ratings, period, right? And and, and through something like the trolley interface. So the, the, the reason I bring that up is something like a day-night rating indicates, if, if you're sending a day-night rating, that indicates that that the reliability coordinator is doing anything dynamic at all with regards to temperature or or something like that. Yeah, and, and me, I guess me, yeah. If I can jump in here, just please. You know, we're the 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 use cases for trolley are, are really um, which we're trying to the simplest possible, but no simpler, right? Um, because what we're trying to do is guarantee interop. Now, different vendors are going to implement that specification and with additional functionality. Um, and you know, like GE's uh, limit exchange, GE Vernova's limit exchange portal, um, obviously is going to support day and night ratings. But um, there's sort of two things here for me. One is, uh, what are the what information do we want in the detailed snapshots um, and in the proposals uh, for for compliance reasons? And um, adding metadata to indicate that this uh, a particular rating for a particular hour in a proposal um, or a, a forecasted snap a, a snapshot. Um, was a day or a night rating um, could be part of that like compliance ensemble of, of metadata about the the ratings and limits and and that's that's something we can hash out in the in the repository and extend um, the the interop spec if the community thinks that's an appropriate sort of writer um, but the the main thing I want to highlight is that the trolley specification is uh, is about that data exchange not necessarily um, how you determine the rating or the limit. Um, and I think we'll save any other commentary for that question um, for, for like the documentation. Yeah. C can I suggest, yeah, one, because there's a couple different ways to look at it. Because there's a, one of the areas where I was going is where you went, Christopher, is the idea, okay, do we want to, when we're exchanging ratings, do we want to tag them that it was a day or night rating? That's, that's one thing. Another thing is, um, so you mentioned for, and, G Vernova, we have a limit exchange portal product, which I work on. And one of the things we're trying to do is looking at, at things we're doing for the, the product and saying, okay, what do we have to, you know, elevate to kind of a trolley like feature. So one of the features we are building for limit exchange portal is this uh, for particular customer, the ability to 
um, submit uh, rating lookup tables, which will obviously have a day and night rating. And so far, we have a fairly minimal ask for that kind of stuff, right? It's just the the the, the, the one customer. But I, I've kind of started to wonder, like, is that a different that whole exchange of of lookup tables as such a common methodology for computing limits is that something that should be in the charlie scope and right now i don't i haven't seen enough push for us to to make it go there but that's that's an area where you could certainly change our minds right and, yeah, and i think that's, that's uh, you got to submit issues and and kind of make a case for like what problem are we solving right so the, i think that that broaches two topics and one um dovetails nicely with the next question yeah um is so one is you know there, so, so MISO is going to uh, utilize uh, the Limit Exchange Portal. It's an implementation of the, it implements the trolley specification, but we're not going to, uh, we're doing real-time ratings primarily through ICCP, right? So as an example of like how you can subset even the trolley functionality, um, and as Tori pointed out, not every use case will be used by every participant in these exchanges. Um, so uh, it may be the case that we could add, a, a, you know, extend the, the trolley sort of set of use cases to include the exchange of uh, tables, uh, temperature tables, lookup tables. Um, but that could you could still be compliant with the real time or the forecasted profiles in that conformance program um, without implementing that. So you know, it's a community and, and we, we need to scratch our own itches and, and, and put it out there. Uh, so, yeah, like as Tori said, let's make the case for that. Um, you know, we we would want to just work out and it, it could have a lot of benefit just to standardize on like what that exchange looks like. Sure. Um, Dan has a question about um, MISO specifically. And I'm, I, I can I'm going to answer that offline, but I want to say, like, it's it's good to talk about SIM. Tori, you mentioned it earlier yeah. um, and how uh, we sort of borrowed power system object and a few other sort of idioms from SIM. But um, what I will say, I think and I think I speak for you as well that um, we're sort of SIM informed, but not, and I'm talking about trolley here specifically. Yeah. We're SIM informed, but we're not looking for any kind of SIM compliance. We don't want to reinvent any wheels, but um, you know, this dynamic rating exchange isn't part of like the SIM users groups like scope or, you know, and I, I haven't yeah. been engaged in that, so I shouldn't speak authoritatively about what they are or are not. But if you're from the SIM users group and you want to talk to us about how we can adopt uh, more of the SIM idioms and, and, and vernacular um, where there's maybe areas for improvement, I will say that MISO is, MISO's implementation is very heavily really leaning on um, our modeling system to, to pre-position the, uh, the limit exchange portal so that we're not um, relying on like admin APIs and such from LEP in order to, you know, preload the data with the network information that we need to do validations and whatnot. Um, but I, I'll save the MISO specific stuff for a, a separate conversation. Right. Um, and and I think it, yeah, because the okay. next one kind of ties into that, right? Um, yeah. So yeah. Nathan's so the, question here. Yeah. yeah. So the rating submission in the, uh, in the patch for the ratings uh, forecast proposals associated with the segment ID. Um, however, branches in the system model are assigned between a front bus and a two bus and are not assigned a unique ID. How will we be using the segment ID field to identify a branch when branches are not assigned unique identifiers? You want to take this one? Yeah, yeah. So um, that's that becomes it's. So it's a great question because it, it th this is where the, the whole naming thing gets kind of messy, right? And it depends on which reliability coordinator you're working with. So so I'm looking at those rules there that they're, they're assigned a from bus and a to bus and are not assigned a unique ID. Um, that may or may not be true depending on, you know, what modeling tools you're using, what EMS products you're using, what, how, and, and Christopher mentioned that the SIM vernacular and the SIM vernacular segments absolutely have unique IDs, right? Um, that's, that's a, that are, they're, that are, formal and, and well published. Um, there are, so there's some reliability customers that that uh, that, that we're working with um, that don't really have any existing SIM stuff. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, we make a big deal about um, names and, and how we deal with, with names. Um, I, what I can tell you is, uh, so uh, for, 
GE Renova's product, we we have some features where, you know, the reliability coordinator can decide what to make that thing. You know, what what is what is that ID um, that that they give you, and and it can map to a number of different things. Um, so, uh, you know, unfortunately, I'd, I'd have to, to to dig into specifics on that that may be specific to, you know one of our contracts and, and and i'm also happy to help too i, I probably need our, our customers to facilitate that um but there's there's things where um you know i i i i've been invited at different times to uh, to talk to um you know member meetings or, or to task force task forces and things like that where where we i i can go into specifics like okay here's here's how we're going to solve this problem um but in general, it's it's up to uh, the trolley kind of the one thing it does is it obligates the hoster of the trolley server, typically your reliability coordinator, to present an ID that you can understand, right? And and map back to you know by you I mean you as a, a transmission owner, or other other user of of uh, other cl trolley client that that, that you can. Um, map to something that you understand. And there's a number of ways to, to do that, right? SIM MRIDs is one, but far from the only one. Um, just, you know, those of you who are familiar with GE's uh, EMS product, um, there's there's sort of a hierarchical identifier system um, that is, uh, you know, obviously predates work with SIM. And, and in some cases that we can, you know, we can use that just as well. Um, there's a number of other options there, but uh, but yeah, that that's um, part of where you know th there's sort of two parts to the answer, right? One is is um, the the trolley specification kind of says, okay, it has to come up with something. We've done we've added some flexibility for that in the G product, but um, the other thing is we can use that header information when we're debugging this and if we have problems with it, so that uh, that we can kind of tie you know, add a little bit more about like, what are we talking about here? Um, and so if I think about things like line segments, you know, we might have a, an alternative name that is just a, um, just the names of the from and to buses, if there is no unique ID, like glued together as a string or something like that. So we're at time, we're a little bit over. Yeah. Um, thank you everyone for your questions and your participation. I apologize, we weren't able to get to all of them today. Uh, we will make an effort to, to, uh, to get back to them. I, I think that will probably be uh, in a follow-up email. I'll need to, to work with Dan on that. Um, Dan, do you have any final uh, comments or, or, or anything before we end this? No, thank you both so much. And thank you to our audience. You will all receive an email summary after um, later today, which will include the recording for this webinar, the slide deck, and uh, all the contact information so that you can follow up with questions via the email list or Slack or GitHub, of course. Um, so thank you again for joining. Yeah, thanks. And, and sorry we didn't get to all of these. Please, uh, please post some of these to GitHub, and we'll we'll take our time with them. Um, thank you. Yep. Thank you, Tori. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you all.